Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is January 28th, 2024. In a few hours, we're going to get the AFC and NFC championship games. Right, let's talk about Jaime Munguia's win over John Ryder. Understand, folks, Jaime has an unbeaten record with more than 40 wins. He is a major emerging story in boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, for those of you who, in my opinion, mistakenly believe that casinos always get it right, that they know things that the public doesn't know, and that they'll set the odds in such a way that that's the likely outcome of the fight. Just understand, you had a huge opportunity. I wish I would have made a pre-fight video. You had a huge opportunity in betting on this fight. Because, as we just saw, it was an all-action fight. Jaime Munguia tends to have all-action fights. Right? He's not defensively blessed. He's extremely high volume. Right? He takes chances. He's jumping in the pocket. He's trying to throw home runs with both hands. Well, just to understand, because Ryder went the distance with a defensively blessed Canelo, and what that means is that Canelo's defense is going to dampen things in a fight. Right? It's not going to get full tilt like Jaime Munguia's fights get. Because Ryder went the distance with Canelo, the casinos offered an under 10 and a half rounds. You heard right, 10 and a half rounds, and they gave you that at a plus 190. For gamblers savvy enough to have grabbed the under on this fight, Tell us the odds you got. Tell us the bet you placed. Tell us how it worked out. Right? Understand, 10 and a half rounds would give you until the midway point of the 11th round. Right? That prop delivered. Let me just be up front here and say I did not make a pre-fight video. I'm just talking in the abstract to gamblers who, you know, made the play. Let's also talk about something else here. And it's very important for fans to take a step back and look at the full picture, right? Soak in all that is boxing. Now, this fight took place in Phoenix, folks. The venue is as much a story as the fighters, right? Understand, more than 10,000 fans showed up in Phoenix, this is not the first fight that's drawn a crowd in Phoenix. Look at the Emmanuel Navarrete fight. Look at the David Benavides fight. Understand, too, I believe this is the first time Munguia has fought in Phoenix. Folks, they gave him red carpet treatment. The crowd booze rider as he's entering the ring. The crowd starts chanting Munguia, Munguia. This was an active crowd. You rarely get a crowd like this for a fight that doesn't have, and we'll get back to this, that doesn't have the biggest names. So here you are with more than 10,000 fans in Phoenix Oscar De La Hoya, big-time promoter, was in attendance. I hope he, in doing the accounting for the fight, in adding up the box office, in looking at the way it played on TV, folks, it felt major, right? I'm hoping that the promoters understand that Phoenix, the we'll call it the Phoenix-Glendale area, if you've been out there, is a major opportunity for the sport. Let's also talk about the unfairness of life. Right? Yes, there are better fighters I've seen than Jaime Munguia. 
But folks, for whatever reason, and this is the way fame operates, for whatever reason, crowds love Jaime Munguia. Jaime Munguia fought in Orange County, California. Now understand, Orange County is a huge opportunity. That's where the Los Angeles Angels play, right? You have a lot of people living in Orange County. It's between two big cities, San Diego and Los Angeles. And I'm telling you, when Jaime fought there, he was the headliner and the fans loved him. Well, here he is in Arizona pulling more than 10,000 fans and they're chanting his name, right? Yes, you have better fighters than Jaime Munguia, but understand he's a headliner in places like Orange County and Phoenix. That's a big opportunity if you're an excellent fighter who the public might not know that well, right? Think Janabek the best at 160, right? If you're a fighter, let's say um, Jamal Charlo, and you're looking to expand your brand in front of a crowd, let's say of at least 10,000 people, of fans who are going to be, you know, into the fight, a crowd that knows boxing, that's out and they're vocal, that's going to play well on TV, and it matters. Right? Because fighters want to be remembered for being involved in successful events. Right? Fan excitement is contagious, too. If I'm in my living room and I'm watching a fight and the fans at the arena on my TV are screaming and stuff, that makes it more exciting for me. If I'm the people behind a Jamal Charlo and I want him to fight in a great event in front of a motivated crowd with a fighter who has defensive lapses, right? With a, with a fighter who's not exactly David Benavides. If I want the payday and I want to be in front of a great crowd, I'm willing to play the role of a villain for a night, right? Because folks, Phoenix is Jaime Munguia country then Munguia is a guy I have to think about, right? This is an open invitation to fighters looking for a vibrant atmosphere against a guy with no losses. So you would have the opportunity to be the fighter who beats him. Think Floyd beating Canelo, right? Where when you see Canelo and you say, wow, who beat Canelo? It's Floyd, it's Bevel. Right? It's just great names. You're in that company. Let's just say this is an opportunity for not just Munguia, who clearly has found a place that loves him, another place that loves him. But this is an opportunity for future Munguia opponents. Now let me just say, and I know knockouts cause amnesia, um, you know, I understand a lot of people are just going to see the results. They're going to look at the highlights. They're going to see Munguia landing some hellacious right hands, right? They're going to see, you know, Ryder's own corner waving the towel, right? Okay, great. Understand there was actually a fight that had some give and take. <laughs> Believe it or not, Ryder had his moments. The tip-off is at the end of the eighth round, right before the big time ninth round. At the end of the eighth round, they interview, Chris Mannix interviews Amir Khan, right? And I'm sure Amir Khan was one of the five or six people in the arena outside of Ryder's quarter who was rooting for Ryder, right? Because he's British and he's out there you know, representing the Union Jack. He's representing the British, the British fighter. But Khan is dead on. He's honest in the interview. When he says, look, at first, this looked like it was going to be a quick fight, an early knockout. But then he points out correctly that now it's a real fight. Now Ryder has an opportunity because Ryder has made a comeback in the fight. 
Right, folks, I'm just telling you. And I know this is not the story hitting the press. That Jaime Munguia is tired later in this fight. And by later, because it's an action fight, <laughs> I'm talking about the sixth round. Right? That's later for these guys. Munguia is tired. Munguia is reverting back to bad habits. We'll talk about it. Right? Then Munguia starts finding himself backing up. Picture that if you have followed Munguia fights. Munguia on his back foot. Why? Because he's getting hit with a stiff jab from a southpaw. Ryder actually shows a lot, believe it or not. In round six, seven, and eight. Now, we'll forget about all of that because of the knockout, right? You know, the highlights are going to dominate the day. The people who missed this fight, who knew that Munguia was the favorite, are going to say, oh, Munguia got the knockout. Okay, Munguia is, after all, a blessed puncher. But just to understand, this is a tale of two fights. Let's talk about both of them. Now, Munguia now has Freddie Roach in his corner. Understand, Ryder is the shorter fighter. That's important because early on, you see Munguia at his best. Folks, this was a new development. Munguia comes out in the first round, and he comes out low. Right? In other words, Munguia, the bigger man, actually bends his knees and comes in low. Folks, it suits his style perfectly. Munguia upright is defensively challenged. He gets hit with tough shots, right? Not just the left jab, he also gets hit with uppercuts. In other words, he's just there when he stands up. But Munguia in the very early rounds, particularly the first round, was a revelation. Right? He has his hands up. He's defensively mindful. Believe it or not, and I know I'm a critic of Munguia's defense. I'm a critic of his defense here in this fight. But not for the first two rounds. You saw what Munguia was working on. Right? Munguia comes in. He's low. He is patient. That's another thing. Right? You know, Munguia is that rare fighter who sometimes throws too many punches. Leaves himself open for counters. Here, early in this fight, Munguia has his hands up, folks. He's defensively mindful. And he's backing up John Ryder, a very tough guy. A guy who himself backed up Callum Smith. Munguia is controlling the pocket early. He's doing it by getting underneath John Ryder. It's hard to find Munguia's body for Ryder because Munguia is bent. And Munguia, who's an excellent hooker, is throwing big hooks, but he's not reckless. Now, that's the best Munguia. The Munguia of the first round is the best Munguia in this fight, right? He's going to the body. He's not reckless. He's defensively mindful. He's lower than Ryder, who seems unable to move him around the ring. If you're Freddie Roach, you want to take your fighter aside and you want to say, hey, Jaime, early on, in my opinion, you were at your best, right? This style would give the elite fighters at 168, and that includes Canelo, problems, right? If you're going to hang against the best, you're going to have to be defensively mindful. You're going to have to think about what happens after you throw punches. In other words, is a Canelo, is a Benavides going to be just waiting for that opportunity to counter you. Right? Munguia also comes in at angles early. 
it's impressive. But like Anthony Yard against Baturbiev, <laughs> and Yard came in on his toes in that fight, right? You know, shooting a jab early uh, before, of course, falling back into Anthony Yard. You understood that Jaime Munguia eventually was going to fall back into being Jaime Munguia, right? It's like the smoker who has given up smoking at the bar until, of course, a few drinks in, they want a cigarette, right? So let me just say, you saw what Jaime worked on. There are times where Jaime's on his toes, believe it or not, and he's dancing. But understand, there was nothing else there, right? He's not on his toes behind a jab, moving around the ring. No, he's on his toes. The only thing I took from Jaime being on his toes was that it kept his opponent guessing on when he was going to enter the pocket. Right, Jaime slowly starts straightening up. That leads to a lot of wrestling between the two men. There's a lot of grappling in this fight. Ryder wants to move Jaime backward. Right, Jaime doesn't want to go backward because you and I know Jaime doesn't have much of a back foot. Let's just be critical, folks. If you're 43 and 0, we're going to look at you and say, okay, well, how would you do against Canelo, Benavides, right? Some of the others. Billy Joe Saunders is back. If I'm Billy Joe, I leap at the opportunity to fight Jaime Munguia, right? Morale. There are a whole host of guys out there. We're going to ask the tough questions. In this fight... Jaime Munguia is best on his front foot when he's fighting low. Unfortunately, that doesn't last, right? He does go back to fighting low in something like the eighth round, but that doesn't last, right? Munguia ends up wrestling with Ryder because, of course, both guys are front foot heavy. Neither guy has much of a back foot. Right, Munguia, of course, the punch pattern is interesting because I've seen Jaime Munguia throw a very good jab, but he doesn't have confidence in it. So he's very hook heavy in this fight. Right, so let me just say this. The Munguia of the early rounds can hang with anybody. He's a blessed puncher. When he has his hands up and when he's fighting low, he's going to give guys problems, right? He just has to, when he's fighting low, figure out a way to guard against uppercuts. Why? Because guys like Canelo have uppercuts, right? Guys like Benavides have uppercuts. That's the crowd you need to think about, right? If you want to get to the very top at 168, you have to think about the very top at 168. Right now, the disturbing part of Jaime Munguia is that Munguia starts to straighten up. He can't maintain being very low. Then his defense degrades. Then he's throwing so many punches that savvy vets can figure out, okay, if I can survive this onslaught, I'm going to have countering opportunities. Right? Munguia also, constant movement between punches. Right? He's moving, he's moving, but he's not adaptive, reactive. So he's moving according to a predetermined pattern that no doubt he's worked on in sparring. But yet, an opponent can figure out the movement and an opponent can time when to throw a jab. Ryder does just that. So I'm just telling you, Munguia starts to run out of gas in the middle rounds of this fight. Ryder is very much in the fight, very much in the fight. 
in the seventh and eighth rounds, right? In my notes here, I put, Ryder starts backing up Munguia behind a jab, right? And keep in mind, Munguia, when he's on his back foot, he's not exactly James Toney or Ray Robinson, right? Let me just say, too, that I thought Munguia lost the sixth round. I thought a boxing match broke out where as the fighters got tired, the space between the fighters started to get greater, right? When they weren't wrestling and when there was a cushion between the two fighters, Ryder had his moments, right? So I thought Ryder looked very good in round six, seven, and eight. Let me find. Uh, let me point out. Round eight's interesting because Munguia starts fast. He's full tilt. Looks like he's on the verge of getting a stoppage. He has Ryder by the ropes. The ref is looking hard at Ryder. This is the first part of the eighth round, but boxing rounds are three minutes long. By the time you get to the second minute of the eighth round. Munguia's tired. Now, both Ryder and Munguia have poker faces, right? Munguia's not the kind of guy to be in the ring huffing and puffing visibly. But let's just say you notice his volume drops in the middle of the eighth round. And then Ryder takes over. He's able to get Munguia on his back foot. Munguia on his back foot is not I mean, Munguia, right? So Ryder, I thought, in the eighth round, and this is the round right before the stoppage, takes over the fight. Then we get the Amir Khan interview. Then we get to the, to the ninth round. Punching power is a beautiful thing to have. Munguia is a blessed high-volume puncher, right? It's power plus volume. He lands a right hand, the world changes, right? Ryder, of course, has the poker face. You understand he's finished. His corner understood it, right? He gets dropped a second time. The corner throws in the towel. So if you're a possible opponent of Jaime Munguia, if you're Jamal Charlo, the hitman, Right? You have to think to yourself, okay, if I can survive the early rounds, force this guy to throw punches, wait for the opportunity to tilt this guy onto his back foot, and if I can hit him with a stiff jab and not get, you know, lulled into a hooking contest, I have an opportunity. Right? In fairness to Munguia, Munguia just started working with Freddie Roach. I'm sure when the two guys sit down and look at the tape, Munguia is going to see the parts of the fight where Ryder was effective with his jab and Ryder was able to move the fight off the ropes into the middle of the ring. Let me point out too, Ryder is playing possum over by the ropes where he waits for opportunities. There's a moment in the later part of this fight where he waits for an opportunity and then throws a beautiful counter left hand, right? It's a beautiful counter left hand. And you understand, Ryder is trying to time Jaime Munguia, right? Munguia has to figure out that he's being timed that if he's in with the KG vet and that KG vet goes over to the ropes, part of it might be by design, right? I believe Munguia needs to work on his back foot, needs to believe in his own jab. The punch selection is crucial here. If you throw too many hooks, eventually an opponent's going to know what's coming, right? It's like the pitcher with a great fastball who throws too many fastballs. Sooner or later, fastball hitters like Otani are going to figure out what you're throwing. Right? Munguia needs to 
back off a little bit from time to time, even if he's landing hooks. He needs to say, okay, let me throw some jabs. Let me also get low. That's the fight I saw. Let me hear from you. Tell me the fight you saw. Let me also congratulate the gamblers who saw the 10 and a half over under at far better than even money and stuck their toe in the water. That bet delivered comfortably. Sometimes you don't need to know who wins a fight. You just need to know the pacing of the fight. Folks, here, this fight was fast-paced, right? It kind of reminded me of that Clarissa Shields fight that she had when she crossed the ocean, one of her recent fights, where the pacing of the fight was so out of control, you understood they're going to get tired here, right? Here, both fighters got tired, in my opinion. And Mungia, blessed puncher, took advantage. That's how I saw it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.